I began thinking about the subject when I was in Peru last autumn. I was doing research for my master thesis in uh, anthropology. And while I was there, I read an article by Michael Talbot called The Universe as a Hologram, which was later turned into a book on the r my left side. And in it, he explores this idea of a, of a holographic paradigm. And also in it, one of the most, uh, one of the greatest, uh, most famous psychedelic researchers, Stanislav Hof, he states that this holographic thinking could actually explain a lot of the transpersonal experiences that his patients were having with LSDs. So feelings like oneness, interconnection, um, a lack of distinction between parts and whole, and feelings of illusory boundaries. And he also states that it would uh, explain why these things are not, uh, not limited in time and space. So when I got back home, I, of course, dr had drank some ayahuasca. And I was trying to integrate these experiences. Because drinking ayahuasca made me feel like I was entering a whole new world, but one that felt as real or even more real than the one I left in the glass. And my, my informants told me the same things. They would say, like, yeah, it's, it's like another world, but it's, it's totally real and I, I, can't, I can't explain it. They would also say, say things like everything is connected, everything is one, and that some people lived in different vibrations than other people. And this all resonated with this article that I'd, that I'd read, and, but I couldn't explain it. And my mind kept returning to it at certain at different moments during my trip. So I want to share some thoughts on this with you. And talk is divided into two parts, namely the first I will be talking about what is a hologram and what is the holographic paradigm. The holographic paradigm actually states that our brains are holograms and folded in a holographic universe. And in the second part, I will try to link it up with psychedelic substances. So what is a hologram? Well, we all know them from science fiction. There, um, Talbot in his book gives this, uh, this example of Princess Leia and Star Wars. So in this example, she, a recorded image of Princess Leia asks the heroes for help. But basically, a hologram is like a three-dimensional image of a pre-recorded object. So it's made by firing a laser and splitting the beam in two. The first beam goes at an object, in this case an apple. The light is reflected. The second beam is rerouted, so it hits this reflecting light. And this creates like an, an interference pattern, and that's captured on film. So this interference pattern, it doesn't look like much. It looks like it represents the ripples in a pond when a stone is thrown at her, or for me, a certain Pink Floyd album. And, um, but when you point a, not, a third laser at this, uh, at this film that has the same frequencies as the primary lasers, it creates the three-dimensional image, the famous hologram. Now this hologram has some important features and the first one is three-dimensionality, which is of course the most famous. It, does, it appears to be three-dimensional and it's described as very lifelike. You can circle it, but when you try to touch it, your hand just waves through. The second feature I would call hole in the half. It doesn't really have a name. This is my name I made up for it. And the thing is when you cut a photograph in half, you just end up with two halves of a photograph. It's ruined. But if you do this, do this with this interference pattern that you captured on film and you eliminate one half, you get the whole picture. And if you eliminate the other half, you also get the whole picture. And you can do this multiple times, but the image will get less and less detailed, but it will retain all of its information. So the third feature is interconnection, is that this implies that everything in this uh, interference pattern is actually interconnected. All the data is kind of just swimming on this film. And the last feature is what I call angulation, is that you can record different images on the same piece of holographic film. So if you change the, the angle at which the laser strike it to record this object, you can actually record different, different images of objects on the same piece of film. So in one angle, you could record this uh, cup of glass. In the other angle, you, can, you could record something entirely different and you can reconstruct whatever you want by changing the angle of the lens of the laser at, that you shine onto the interference pattern to get the hologram. So you can create, you can store an enormous amount of data on a small piece of film. 
now I will try and uh, I will go further and link this up with the holographic paradigm. So, neurophysiologist Carl Prybram first suggested that the brain could have holographic features because he witnessed uh, some e experiments in neurophysiology that he couldn't explain by scientific standards at the time. Now, one of these experiments involved cutting away portions of the brains of rats, and these rats had been taught to run an obstacle course, and they wanted to disable them from doing so by cutting away portions of their brain, because the thought was that memory is very localized. You get memory A, it's in, imprinted in place A, memory B is imprinted in place B, so if you cut away portions of their brain, they lose the ability to memorize it, but what they found was that no matter what part of the brain they they cut away, the rats always retained memory of this, of this obstacle course. Now this experiment was um, repeated by a biologist in the 80s called Paul Peach. We did the same thing with salamanders, again he removed their brains, he turned them around upside down, placed them back, but their, their behavior always returned to normal. Now this excited Prybram and he began devising more experiments to uh, underbuild his case. One of them, he devised an experiment to show that vision was also holographically recorded by removing parts of the visual cortex of uh, monkeys. Now in these experiments we can see some features of the hologram. Namely, the three-dimensionality of vision, of course. The second feature, hole in the half, uh, you can see when you remove a portion of the brain but it still retains the whole memory. And Angulation feature could explain the vastness of memory storage that's possible in human brains. Now, Prybram got to reading about holograms and he actually he eventually ended up with physics where uh, he was glad to discover the work of a physicist called David Bohm, who actually, just like Prybram, he witnessed some experiments in physics that he couldn't explain by physics standards or any science standards at the time. And so he began to thinking as well that the universe could have holographic qualities after discovering what holograms were. Now one of these experiments involved uh, subatomic particles and um, the thing is when subatomic particles behave only like particles when they're being observed. When they're not observed they're actually just a wave of possibilities, they're possible particles. This is uh, the, a famous experiment that uh, tells about this is a double split I slit experiment. You can look it up on YouTube, it's, ex it's explained very well. So uh, because of this uh, feature, other physicists got to thinking that it's possible that um, particles have no measurable qualities before they are observed. So if you're, if you're not observing these qualities, it's just a homogeneous mass. They don't have mass or weight or depth or any, any other feature. And then in 1982, another physicist called Alan Aspect actually discovered that under certain circumstances, these subatomic particles, they, inter they communicate instantaneously, faster than light, which is something that was believed as impossible because it negates Einstein's faster than light uh, limitations. So, Bohm believes that this is possible, this, inter, this uh, instantaneous communication, because on a deeper level of existence, these particles are not separate, they're actually just one particle. And piecing these two experiments together, Bohm concluded that a holographic universe best provided uh, the answers for physics. Now these experiments lead us to believe then that if we're not looking at this world, there's nothing concrete there. So if we're not observing it, it's just a wave of possibilities or an interference pattern. And the experiment by Aspect and Esteem also implies that this interference pattern is extremely interconnected. Furthermore, it would also mean that our brains are actually necessary to interpret these interference patterns into a three-dimensional and cohesive reality. And science is also uh, returning to this idea, to exploring this idea. You can get some examples here. This is an article from 2015. So they're trying to, physicists are trying to uh, prove these, uh, these findings. So but this of course begs the question that if the universe is a hologram, then what is it a hologram of? And 
for Bond, this was very simple. He just said that, well, underlying it all is like this vast and more primar primary level of uh, reality that gives birth to all the objects that we perceive and all the appearances in our physical world in the same way that a piece of holographic film gives, gives birth to the hologram. Now he calls this deeper level of reality unfolded or implicate order and our visible reality is unfolded or explicate order because it unfolds out of this deeper level, level of existence. Now between the two there's a constant interplay. So in this view what happens is that our holographic brains create three-dimensional world out of the underlying or implicate order in much the same way as that a laser recreates a three-dimensional image out of the holographic film. And this is a point that's actually been made by mystics and spiritual traditions around the world because the Hindus say that the world is Maya, it's an illusion. Or Buddhists say that everything is, everything is one and uh, interconnected. And many of my informants also reported similar feelings after an ayahuasca ceremony. So now I'll try to link this up with uh, the psychedelic experience actually. Because what are psychedelics? Terence McKenna called them deconditioning agents. They would decondition your social and cultural beliefs. And Stanislav Hof called them non-specific amplifiers of consciousness. I believe both are right actually, and more so I believe it goes further than that. Because every time I'm under, I was under the influence of ayahuasca or any other psychedelic substance, I, I could feel the world becoming a bit more liquid than before. And all uh, socializations began to become less natural and less clear. Many things that always felt natural became less and less normal. So Aldous Huxley gives a beautiful account of this in his book, uh, The Doors of Perception. He talks about chairs not being chairs, they're just geometrical shapes and art not being art but a representation. And anyone who has ever taken a psychedelic can attest to what I mean. It's like childlike wonder in the sense of to wonder returns to this world and you see everything with new eyes. So Stanislav Grof in the book states that this holographic paradigm could indeed explain many phenomena his patients encountered in altered states of consciousness such as regression, reliving past memories or past lives, identification with other life forms, planets or the universe, and many similar phenomena are also encountered throughout Benny Shannon's ayahuasca study, The Antipods of the Mind. So how can this holographic paradigm help in investigation of psychedelic substances? Well, first, I think that this concept of the implicate order is a very useful, very usable concept. Remember that Bohm described this order as being the formless energy out of which the entire universe uh, is made, out of which everything concrete is drawn. And that it is also interconnected through space and time. Now we could use this concept to possibly identify the origins of the realms people visit when exploring altered states of consciousness. And as psychedelics allow people to encounter an incredibly wide variety of mental and physical states, sensual experiences and modalities of being, this implicate order could give an, an inclination of where this might come from. So according to Grof, the enormous capacity for information storage and retrieval of the brain could also explain the vividness and detail of these worlds that are, that are explored. In a quote by Grof, Bohm's concept of unfolded and unfolded orders and the idea that certain important aspects of reality are not accessible to experience and study under ordinary circumstances are of direct relevance for the understanding of unusual states of consciousness. Individuals who have experienced various non-ordinary states of consciousness, including well-educated and sophisticated scientists from various disciplines, frequently report that they entered hidden domains of reality that seem to be authentic and in some sense implicit in and supraordinated to everyday reality. So instead of an hallucination, psychedelics could allow us to look at holographic reality from a different angle and experience a different modality of it. Remember that angulation is a feature of the hologram. Secondly, the holographic qualities of the brain could explain why people under the influence of psychedelic substances can regress to any stage in their development. This is not surprising if we view the brain as having holographic qualities in memory storage. It can literally store any moment that we have ever witnessed. 
And what's more, these qualities extend beyond the brain to our individual cells, what the brain, this, what the brain is made of, which suggests that because of this, it's also possible to regress before our own, before our own memory and development into the womb, or even experience memories from our mother when she was biologically connected to us. Now, oh, sorry. Lastly, this interconnection principle also um, allows for identification, um, could shed light on identification with other organisms, planets, the universe as a whole, encountering archetypes and many more phenomena. Now what I also want to talk about is the reverse side of this investigation, that is it possible to use psychedelics to explore this notion of a holographic view of reality? Because at the moment all findings of this uh, view are done by physicists in laboratories, and maybe psychedelics could again become what they have been for psychology for so long, microscopes or telescopes for looking at this. Now, a couple of examples spring to mind. The first one is, of course, the distortion of time that happens when under the influence of these uh, substances. So a couple of seconds can swing by in a lifetime, or a lifetime can, or, sorry, <laughs> or a life, a couple of seconds can last a lifetime, or a lifetime can swing by in a couple of seconds. And according to David Bohm, this is a normal feature of this implicate order, because there's no spatial or temporal separation. Secondly, it could also shed light on the necessity for our brains to uh, turn these frequencies into observable reality. Now, one of my informants in Peru told me that this was the most important thing that Ayahuasca taught him. And he even went so far as to suggest that we should uh, let little children experience and learn this for themselves, all ethical considerations aside. And um, independently, another person also told me a simu similar story. He told me that Ayahuasca taught him that he molds reality out of his thoughts. So it's, it could be a valid uh, research uh, point. And a third example I want to talk about is angulation, or seeing different information based on uh, your angle of perception. I got to thinking about this by things that kept happening to me in Peru. For example, when I was uh, in an Ayahuasca ceremony, I noticed that my surroundings reflected the processes I was undergoing. For example, if I was dealing with changes in my present or my past, I would see a lot of butterflies because these animals are associated with change. If I was clearing emotional or physical baggage, I would see a lot of ants because ants are associated with clearing and uh, cleanliness. And during the last stage of my, uh, of my stay, I would I was confronting a lot of things about death in general and I, in, at that time I saw the most flies I ever saw during my time in Peru and there's, there are a lot of flies in Peru. But I almost saw no butterflies and no, no ants. So is it possible that different mental states mean that different angles of reality are noticed, that our mind singles out various frequencies according to its own inner state and constructs our surrounding based on these? so that I would see more flies when confronting feelings about end of life because I associate certain feelings with certain animals. Many times my informants would talk about people being on different vibrations. Maybe you've heard someone say this yourself, that someone is on a high or a low vibration. But could this be taken literally maybe? It would mean that two people sitting next to each other could be experiencing a very different uh, view of the world. Now what's more, could we train ourselves to stay in a certain angle? A friend of mine brought this up in a discussion about the marijuana mind state. She said that habituation to marijuana or any other substance is like getting used to the different reality that you enter when you uh, smoke or ingest this substance. So someone who drinks a lot of ayahuasca or takes a lot of LSD or psilocybin mushrooms would easier navigate these realms because he makes them their own. He would become permanently, permanently exposed to seeing holographic reality from a different angle. And this could be the case with shamans around the world. So could it be that taking a psychedelic substance triggers a reaction in our holographic brain that causes a shift in the angle of the lens responsible for creating three-dimensional world we experience? Well, we know psychedelics work on certain receptors in the brain. So is it possible that by altering these, we alter what information we get from this implicate order? Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for this. 
Now, the last thing I want to talk about is how this could impact today's understanding of uh, psychedelic medicine. Because the incredible healing that occurs through serious treatment with these substances could have an explanation in this model. In his book, Michael Talbot describes un unbelievable feats of healing on all fronts, physical and mental. He talks about visualization, hyp hypnosis, trance ESP healing, meditation, all, as all ways to access this implicate order and refocalize a patient's reality. But psychedelics have the added benefit of speed and accessibility. They work very fast and they work for almost everyone. But they have the downside of generating unwanted results sometimes and possibly even dangerous results when handled uh, carelessly. Yet in the 60s, Ralph Metzner and Timothy Leary wrote an article called On, Progr On Programming Psychedelic Experiences, in which they state that it's possible to curate a psychedelic experience to generate any wanted outcome based on set and setting, famous mind and surroundings. So maybe in time with more research being done around psychedelic substances and this holographic paradigm, we could even further specify the outcome of psychedelic experiences. Now in conclusion, can we use psychedelics to explore this idea of a holographic universe? And can we use concepts from this holographic universe to talk about psychedelics? Well, possibly, when the science behind, behind both is at a more advanced stage. But at the moment, it's just mostly conjecture. As David Bohm stated himself, it's a mixture of pragmatic parts and some highly speculative, non-pragmatic aspects in a very unbalanced way. But to me, this thinking could theoretically ground a lot of my own experiences. Now, this talk has been an attempt to revisit this holographic thinking, to shed some new light on it, and also an attempt to look at psychedelic phenomena from a different standpoint. And I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you.